welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. We've got a special show this episode with a live audience for our dangerous discussions. And please welcome our special guests tonight. We have Kelly Tranter, John Kay, and Susan Price. I'm going to kick it off with my first question before we throw it to the audience. So my question is related to a point that the Israeli historian Ilan Pape made when he was here in Australia. And his argument is that Israel is an apartheid state. Is Israel an apartheid state? And if that's the case, should we not treat Israel the same way that South Africa was treated? Well, I think for me, it's a fairly simple proposition. The reality is that for 64 years, there's been a siege and occupation, now a wall that's been constructed, which I think is about 700 kilometres long, cutting off communities from each other. Even within Israel itself, while Jewish Israelis get to experience full citizenship rights, Israeli Arabs have, I think, about 27 laws that are specifically designed to control their movements within the country and don't enjoy full citizenship rights. You've got virtually starvation and siege-like conditions in the occupied territories that has only really been able to continue with its occupation thanks to massive amounts of injection of aid from the United States and support, unfortunately, from governments like our own. The situation for Palestinians now is very much like it was for blacks in South Africa and I really do support the campaign for boycotts, divestments and sanctions because I believe that it is time for the international community and for governments like our own to send a strong message to Israel that you know this cannot be tolerated. I have always struggled with governments that make laws on the basis of people's ethnicity or on the basis of their religion. I think there's something badly wrong with that. It's very hard to disguise that in any other way. We've had decades of propaganda trying to tell us it's the only democracy in the Middle East, trying to tell us that it's a struggling society surrounded by hostile neighbours. There's the Holocaust guilt that's run. There's a whole range of propagandas that have been presented. But in the end, you just strip it back to this. I have a friend, he's a Palestinian bloke. Uh, his father, grandfather, great-grandfather had an olive grove and he wanted to take his kids, he lives in Australia, he's an Australian citizen, he wanted to take his sons back to see the olive grove, a reasonable proposition. He was stopped at the border and not allowed in. I, because I'm of Jewish extraction, can present myself to that border and I can say I want to be a citizen and I become a citizen. I really struggle with any, any proposition that allows that to happen. I have to say, though, there's an air of optimism in all of this, which is I think the tide is turning. Amongst the populations of Europe, Australia and America, probably less than Australia, but certainly, and even amongst the Jewish population of America and Europe, there isn't the same unquestioning acceptance of what Israel does. And I think the settlements were such a, a, an overt example of imperialism at the expense of individuals' lives, you know, the way people's Palestinians, Palestinians who are just seeking to live their life were losing their livelihoods as a result of this. That's pushed the envelope so far that I think there's now a new discussion happening on, on Israel in America. When we look back at South Africa, the majority of white South Africans supported their government. And what brought South Africa to its knees on this particular issue was obviously being shunned at the UN, being shunned at sporting organisations and financial sanctions So it was a, and internal act activism as well. So uh, it was a combination of those responses. More importantly, our government's position is what alarms me. So they're saying publicly to our people, we are for a state, a two-state solution, but they are voting with Israel, the United States and a swarm of smaller islands owned by the United States uh, against that position, or abstaining, which was the last vote, they abstained from that. Thanks Kelly. We're going to move to getting some questions or responses from the audience. Well, here's a dangerous thought, I thought. I'm persuaded that what we see in Israel is a form of apartheid. Mm. But a lot of people in this country hesitate. People think, oh, you couldn't possibly mm. call such civilised people, you know, associate them with apartheid. Mm. But I would, I would ask Australians to reflect on this. 67% of Australians, according to polls, are quite willing to accept or in fact endorse policies towards refugees and asylum seekers in this country. 
that are equally discriminatory. So I think it's very understandable, both in the present time in this country, but also in Australia's history. I mean, I came to this country in the 1970s, and I don't think Australian attitudes were that different from attitudes of white South Africans, by and large. I think they were pretty, pretty similar. I don't actually blame the Australian people for the opinion polls that are coming out about asylum seekers, nor do I actually blame the Israeli people for their attitudes to Palestinians. The reality is, is that both sets of people have been fed appallingly bad uh, propaganda about the other side. You know, if you pick up the Telegraph, you pick up, you watch uh, commercial TV, even the ABC, the, the polemic about asylum seekers has been so profoundly dehumanising and hostile, it's hardly surprising people have these attitudes. Why has Israel been able to comprehensively uh, and continually defy the UN and the court of the, the international courts? Largely, the answer is because the United States, with Australia standing there as the handmaiden, have been have run cover for Israel, constantly run cover for Israel. And I must say, I think the the diasporian Jewish community, the Jewish community of America and Australia. In, and England in their absolutely unquestioning Israel is right and we will defend it no matter what it does we will defend it are very guilty in this in many ways more guilty than some of the the, the perpetrators in Israel itself it's my turn to ask a question Ooh, lucky you lucky me <laughs> and I my question is how much can we call Australia a democracy we're taught that we have elected representatives if there's something that we don't like about our laws or our society we can go to them we can lobby them, we can talk to them, and they will represent us and get the law changed. Anyone who's been involved in the Stop CSG campaign or anti-war movement realises just how difficult it can be when the majority of Australian opinion says one thing, wants one thing, um, and the you know parliament, state parliament or federal parliament does something completely different. How democratic is Australia really? Australia is, is a democracy in a limited sense. It's a democracy for some. I think it's certainly a democracy for the rich. Where does power really lie um, in, a, in a country like Australia, for example? Is it the argy-bargy that goes on across each side of Parliament, or is it really the conversations and the deals and the agreements that are being made outside of that in the corridors <laughs> of power, as they say? If we're really going to create a society that's in the interests of us as the majority, we really need to build a fundamentally very different kind of democracy, a democracy that's actually about people's mm. power, about the participation of ordinary working people in the decisions that affect their lives, not the decisions that are made, you know, in the corporate boardrooms. Oh, so I think you're being too harsh. You're forgetting the fact that Australia has three levels of government. The first being the banks, the second being the real estate developers, and the third being the mining corporations. <laughs> the no, of course, you're absolutely right. I think there are two ways you can answer that question. The first way is, is Australia a democracy? Well, it depends who you're asking. If you're asking an Aboriginal person in the Northern Territory who has had almost all of their rights to economic self-determination taken away from them, the answer is very clearly no. Uh, if you ask some of my neighbours in the eastern suburbs who are earning very handsome incomes and able to, to, with taxpayer assistance, send their children to very wealthy schools that are, that are subsidised by your money and mine, then yeah, they, they, they would feel they lived in a democracy. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that where you have a, a highly disparate class structure, we have it which creates a highly disparate relationship in terms of power, then any words of democracy are kind of a window dressing. It's more a matter of keeping the oppressed under control. It's more a propaganda campaign. It always worries me when people ask this question, um, and that's because it says to me that the undercurrent behind that question is that people feel helpless, that people feel disempowered, that people don't feel that they're getting access to information to help them make informed decisions. It says to me that uh, they don't feel like they're a part of the decision-making process and, in fact, sidelined. And all of that, of course, is true. But I also don't think democracy is the end. I think democracy is the means. To make the democracy work, people have to participate. You know that. But people don't for a variety of reasons. I would argue that Australia is a demography rather than a democracy. <laughs> I come from the Northern Rivers and we're suffering very badly up there at the moment with the coal seam gas yes. um, companies mm. uh, moving in on us and people 
across the board, regardless of political persuasion, uh, day and night doing vigils to try to stop the coal seam gas companies who have just walked in without any warning and just started drilling in the land. I'd like to know if there's any way we could get a class action together against the coal seam gas companies and against the government that is conspiring with those coal seam gas companies and robbing us of our human rights. Coal seam gas is a huge issue and I'm very pleased that it was raised. Thank you. I'm from the Hunter Valley, so I'm not from Sydney. I know what's going on in the Hunter Valley. Mm. Again, it's all grassroots. The mistake organisations always make is they run on a single issue. You run on a single issue and you're dead. Um, because for a movement to grow and to expand and to recruit, it needs to have lots of different issues. Cross-pollinating with other organisations is critical. It's basically saying, we can't do it without you, you can't do it without us, we need to, to, to form an alliance. When Julian Assange about the mainstream media, he said, this generation is burning the mainstream media to the ground. I'd like to hear the, the panellists' view on that, but more in particular, what's, what's taking its place? And I think, in reality, that's the rise of social media. And how we saw it play out with Israel-Palestine, Israel announced the war on Twitter. And I guess more in particular, whether you could speak about the liberty, like how social media can be used as a tool of liberation, but also do you see any downside to, to its rise? There's a mythology, if you like, that is rife in, in Australian culture, this idea that Australia is a classless society that by and large we live very not dissimilar lives and basically have the same interests. And I think social media has a role to play here of dispelling and exploding a lot of those myths. Print media is dying. The Sydney Morning Herald is, is on its last legs. The Murdoch is in trouble. Uh, I think social media is playing an increasingly important role. When I talk to young people, I always ask them, what do you know and how do you know it? And the how do you know it's always more interesting than the, the what do you know. How they know it is largely from social media. So I think we are, we're on the cusp of some very interesting things. To what extent do you think that grassroots campaigns can actually contest the elections or uh, you know, the political sphere in a world where you have such unequal economic power? And ownership. I'd like to have an experiment where the Liberal Party had to run its election campaign on the same budget as the Socialist mm. Alliance. I think that would be <laughs> an extremely democratic uh, experiment in the power of power of the dollar in terms of electoral campaigning. I ran as an independent candidate day. You cannot compete with the resources of the major political parties for a, for a lot of reasons. I think I spent $60,000 on a state campaign as an independent candidate. You need money, resources, people. You need to network and you can challenge and will challenge, but it won't happen in 24 hours. The Obama victory in America was partly because he was smarter in the way he used his advertising dollars, but also because he had an on-the-ground campaign. And this is, if there's one good thing that can be said about Obama, it was his capacity, his campaign's capacity to motivate neighbourhoods to become politically engaged. He did so by getting people to talk to each other about politics. They had a whole process of identifying people in each neighbourhood and getting them to talk to each other. Look, this guy Obama, he's doing good things on health care. That is a deeply radical outcome. I mean, Obama himself is not a radical man, but I think unwittingly they are profoundly radicalising politics. I think there are ways we can do that in Australia that break the stranglehold of large capital over, over election campaigns. And I must say, I look forward to the day when election campaigns are the battle of ideas, not the battle of checkbooks. My next question is about the mining industry. Not the miners, but the big mine owners. Mm. What are we going to do about them? There's a host of <laughs> ecological and social illnesses which they're responsible for. For example, Gina Reinhart, who last year earned more, quite a bit more, in one year than is the whole health budget for New South Wales. Mm. Another way to put it is she made 41 times the GDP of East Timor, population of one and a half million people. So my question is, what are we gonna do about them? And I want you to respond to, to my idea, which is simple. What is underneath the ground already legally is public property. Minerals are public property. That extraction of that should also be public. So put an end to private mining. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess Gina Reinhart aside, and uh, we could have a brainstorm after the show about what we might like to do with the, um, the mining owners, but I do believe that the wealth that lies beneath our ground belongs to the people, and it should be used 
if it's going to be used at all, and I'm not saying that just because minerals are there they should be dug up, but when they are, it should be for the benefit of the people. The government spends only 3.6% of GDP on education across all tertiary, primary and secondary. Um, imagine what we could do in terms of giving a boost to that sector. And by comparison, a country like Venezuela, prior to it nationalising its oil industry, uh, spending on education was only at about 3.9% of GDP. Since nationalising the oil sector, they now spend 7% of GDP on education across the board, which is double just about what <coughs> Australia is spending um, on education. And this is, this is a country that's not as wealthy as Australia in many respects, or, nor as developed. So an amazing achievement there in a small country that, that actually did take over uh, its own natural resources for the good of the population. I'll be really brief. I'm a, a tax, regulate and plan kind of guy. I think we should tax the hell out of what mining happens. I think we should regulate it really tightly. Uh, and I think we should plan what goes ahead. Right now, you can mine whatever you like. If you can find something, you can mine it, basically, in New South Wales or Australia. We should stop that happening. We should have an industry plan for mining. An industry plan that's based on what's good for all of us, what's good for our economy. Yes, there's money to be made there, but whatever money we make today, we won't be making tomorrow. So we need to recognise the finite nature of that resource and use it very carefully. Every time the Greens say the word coal, somebody, not this audience, but every other audience I've spoken to, somebody will leap up and shout, scream, blathering at the mouth, jobs, what about jobs? Yeah, well, what about jobs? If we turn New South Wales alone, just to pick on the state we're in at the moment, if we turn New South Wales into 100% renewable energy, we generate about 73,000, 74,000 new, ongoing, high-quality, unionised jobs. That's about double the number of jobs there are in the coal mining industry. If we then said, OK, we're going to turn that, they're going to turn that, those renewable energy jobs, and we're going to use as a platform to export renewable energy, both expertise and technology, we'd probably double it again. We could have a boom that was not based on minerals, but based on something sustainable that was good for the planet. Mining doesn't create wealth for all of us. It makes some corporations very wealthy. It attracts cash into the country, which then goes out again. What we need to do is get the jobs in Australia and do the, the manufacture here in Australia to get the export to really make Australia economically secure. We've got the super profits tax, <laughs> which is supposed to be all of these things that we, we want, which is getting money from the bigger miners so that we have more money to go into health hospitals, the disability support pension and so forth. And what actually happened was without negotiating with the states, we have a model whereby the states are increasing their royalties as hurting smaller miners and the bigger miners get a rebate. I'm from an electorate a mining town. You can't go out and say nationalise mines. It's a very complex question and politicians will not, as much as we would like it, um, nationalise the mines in the foreseeable future. You would see people exiting the country if, you, you know, and you get the CIA agents coming in, creating a coup. It's not something that's likely to happen. The coal seam gas companies are not giving anybody any warning. They're coming in sometimes at night with their rigs. It's very underhand. It's not actually creating jobs for the local people. A company like that that comes in and flies in and flies out destroys all what has taken years and years for a, a fairly isolated country town to build up. You can bet your boots that there are a lot of people that feel that way in that community. And the key is to get them together. Because at the moment they're probably sitting behind closed doors feeling that they can't do anything. So they feel disempowered. We have to go out and seek these people. You have to recruit them. You ha and, and not into a cult, into a movement which has common interests with lots of other people within the community who feel this common thread of being disempowered and overrun and not being listened to. That is the key. There is amongst ordinary middle class Australians anger at the mining companies. doesn't mean that you know, they, they support taking them over, but, mm. you know, but there is a lot of anger. Given that we don't have a long term, that is, we're actually discussing the need for a rapid shift towards renewable energy that's sure. often been compared, though mm -hmm. you understand the science, that this will mm -hmm. require a World War II-esque total reorientation mm -hmm. of industry. How much of that needs to be publicly driven? The role of public spending, and then from that, what's the role of public ownership in that. In America, with Hurricane Sandy, we've seen a re-awareness of the climate crisis that's bearing down on us and the role that climate change is having to play on uh, natural disasters and actually impacting our lives very directly. What is it going to take? What is it going to take? It does 
require pain and heartache. That's what makes people move. When it affects them personally, that's what makes them move. And that's the reality. You have to work out what is going to be acceptable to the mainstream. What argument are you going to run that will recruit people in the mainstream? What's going to turn them off? It's a slow, slow process. But you get there and you have to stick together. That's all I'm saying. I have a different view to Kelly on, on mining. And I, I say this as somebody who's worked in a mine. I think most people who work in mines would be happy to do something else. They don't actually no, like mining. No, I, we don't do you know, they don't, like, they don't yeah. like what it does to their kids. They don't like what it does yeah. to themselves. I think CSG drilling will be the same as people yeah. realise what it's like. They'll, they'll recognise the same thing. I think nationalisation is like privatisation. has various flavours. And I think I broadly agree with you. And it's like this. We say, OK, we own those resources. We're going to stop the exploitation of those resources in an uncontrolled fashion. We're going to allow some of them to be exploited. We're going to use the profits from those. We're going to tax those profits really heavily. So we're going to invest them in building new industries in those areas that are currently mining industries. Be realistic about our coal industry. Our coal industry is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions when the export coal is burnt than we create with everything we do here in Australia. We can't go on. The planet's dying. Mm -hmm. We can't go on. We, sooner or later, those people who live in Kelly's electorate, who make their living off mining, and it's only about 9% of your electorate to do that, we have to find another job for them. And we can do that. We can put them into renewable energy. The biggest blockage to rapid change is, is the corporate interests of the fossil fuel companies. Mm. I mean, they own most of the renewable technology out there for a start. So really, if we're, if we're going to break through, which I think, I think we have to, it's got to take on the fossil fuel giants. We can actually make decisions as workers employed in the industry, but also as the communities affected by that industry in conjunction with the government, if you like, to actually work out, yes, are we going to close this mine? How are we going to actually transition jobs without workers having to pay the price? Where are we going to use the wealth that's being uh, created out of mines that do continue? Mm. How can that be actually put towards reinstalling universal health care um, from cradle to grave, which we've, we've abandoned, you know, in favour of private health insurance. Julia Gillard sparked a, a big debate about feminism a couple of months ago when she called Tony Abbott a misogynist in Parliament, um, which was a great moment for, for many people. A lot of people really responded to her calling out Tony Abbott and actually talking about these issues. And so my question is, just had more women in positions of power in Parliament, in the boardrooms, would that make feminism irrelevant? Susan. No. <laughs> oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> the tragedy of, of, of that day, if you like, of, of Gillard's anti-misogyny speech was that in that same sitting of Parliament, the government passed legislation cutting the single parents' pension. This is mm. the irony of it all for those of us who, I guess, are more active in the grassroots. I think that the women's movement is as necessary today as it's ever been. I mean, you just look at the gender pay gap in Australia, about 18% still. Mm. In Australia, women have made great gains. Um, and the fact that we now have a female prime minister is very symbolic of, of the advances that women have made. So for a certain class of women, if you like, there's been major gains. For a lot of working class women and middle class women, they are finding themselves working in more and more insecure employment. Um, it's like 30%, I think, of women in the workforce who are in casual work. Certainly, um, violence in the home um, is a very serious problem. But I don't think we've arrived at a situation where feminism is now of the past. We actually do need to keep struggling, and I think it's very important for those of us on the left to be part of building that independent women's movement. The following figure is more emblematic of what's really happened with the advances of feminism. There are now more women who graduate from universities than men. That's a terrific advance. But in their first year out, women pay, get, women get paid $2,000 a year on average less. By their seventh year out, they're getting paid $7,500 less per year. So what does that say? It says, yes, we've made advances in some aspects, but those advances are being overridden by the fact that we still have a market capitalism system that drives down women's wages. The project of feminism of economic equality has not been achieved. Uh, and we're a long way from it until we, we have a situation where an Aboriginal woman in the Northern Territory has the same access to economic independence that a wealthy white bloke in the eastern suburbs of Sydney has, we still need feminism. But there's another sense in which feminism is not now dead and probably won't be dead for a very long time. And it is that 
Feminism is, is one of the most accessible analyses of power and the need to redistribute power. The analysis of looking at the women around you and understanding the way they are disempowered by your behaviour and by the system that you live in and the system that you as a bloke profit from is a very fundamental and important analysis. The project of making sure that men understand that and understand it not just in the context of gender politics, but also in the, pol in the concept of uh, gender identity politics, in the context of race politics and class politics, it has a long way to go. Once upon a time, particularly my mother, once she got married, that was the company policy, they didn't employ married women. That's beyond the experience of a young woman today. Things are by and large equal in schools, things are by and large equal in universities, but they hit the workplace and something happens. And that's a cultural mm. thing. And I would like to think that this is where the, the women's movement is now going, is how do we tackle the power structures? which is what you're alluding to, because it's no longer we can have a life beyond being a housewife. It is now, what is it that, that makes us the cheap labour upon which everything runs? And it's tackling those power structures that I think the modern feminist needs to look at. My question is about what uh, the Women's Liberation Campaign should be fighting for. What will be a focus of, I guess, that sort of campaign that can galvanise people around? There's genuine um, burning anger uh, amongst a lot of young women about the sorts of messages that they are getting from popular culture. What it says about their body image, what sort of cosmetic surgery do I need to have in order to you know, be acceptable in this completely commodified uh, environment. So I, I think as much as the, the movement is about defending gains and extending gains for women, it's also about taking up issues like sexism more generally in popular culture, for example. But of course, when questions of protesting against violence against women comes up, I think these have to be campaigns that are alliances between women and men. So thank you everybody for coming. And I'd like to thank our special guest, Kelly Tranter, John Kay, and Susan Price. And I'd also like to thank our fantastic crew Yay. for filming it. These means and minds you fall. A tumble spent with backs against the wall. The gift of life is no gift after all. And so for this, the struggle must continue. The resistance will survive alive with a definite function, not for those with a definite